want to read, if you look down with me, uh, to verse 27. And uh, just look at a couple of verses this evening. Really, there's a few chapters that have the same theme, but I want to look at two contrasts this evening. Verse 27, the Bible says, And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto, thy, unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by the fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and at mine offering which I have commanded in my habitation? And honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. Now let's stop there and we'll pray. We'll ask God's help tonight. God, I pray this evening that you would help us to see some perspectives and principles about responding to the privilege of knowing you. And I pray that your work would just sink into our hearts and that knowing the truth of it would affect us, God, to make decisions about how we respond to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Eli's a conundrum, isn't he? A little bit confusing. Uh, how many of you think Eli's likable? I like the way he handled the way that he handled Hannah and Elkanah, don't you? Last week we looked at, at Hannah and her prayer to the Lord and we just looked at the depth of the understanding of the relationship that that woman had with the Lord. And you look, we looked at her circumstances and we really didn't offer a lot of commentary on it, but we just looked at things that Hannah knew about God. Eli's initial response when Hannah was before the altar praying was to think that she was drunken. But then, after he heard her out and listened to what she said, his response was really to receive what she prayed to the Lord. And I'll be honest with you, think of this. Think of being an older man who's already done a poor job raising his children and being given a, a child who has just been weaned from his mother. I don't know what age he could have been. I certainly don't think that he would have been older than four, probably three, maybe two, somewhere in that age. I don't know exactly how old he is. But I'll just tell you this, I would not look forward to the prospect in Eli's situation of raising a four-year-old. Would you? I mean, just, hey, look, I've given you my son to serve in the temple. Well, thanks a lot. Huh. <laughs> Who serves? Toddlers or... I mean, how many parents are like, man, I'm glad I had a four-year-old so that they could, uh, you know, take care of things around that. Now, teenagers. Teenagers are valuable. Yes, they are. Teenagers are useful. Teenagers can do just about anything an adult can without the ability to say no. So they, you know what I mean? Like they're, they're like perfect. I remember my dad when I was a teenager, my brother was a teenager, my sister was a teenager, saying, you know, I think I'm going to have a second litter. He said, this is pretty good. <laughs> Have another bunch of Because we did everything. My dad and brother had to do all my dad's work. Not my dad, my brother. My brother and I, we had to run the savage yard. We had to run the car crushing opera. We did everything. I remember when I was 17 years old, my dad, uh, we, were, we were doing car crushing down in Newton, Kansas. And it was just my dad and I. And all he did was drive a truck to Wichita every time I had a load of crushed cars ready. I did everything. I prepped them, I crushed them, and I loaded them. And, and then when they was ready to go, he'd drive the truck back and forth. He's like, you're doing a really good job. You're getting really good at this. You know? <laughs> I remember when, when I was like 13 to 14 years old, really even 12, you know, my dad would leave me at the car lot and be like, well, i gotta go, I got to go check on something. I mean, check on something means I left in the morning, I come back and get you at the end of the day. You know? <laughs> I don't know where he went. You know, I, in, in, in the junkyard, you do the same thing. Teenagers are pretty useful, but toddlers? Toddlers now? I'm not saying you can't train them and get some good value out of them, but mostly you spend your time um, training. And training's a lot of work. 
Training's a lot of work. I know from the perspective of a pastor, don't take this the wrong way uh, because you'll be sinful if you do. But <laughs> it, as, as, a, as a preacher, it's tough for me to keep track of, of people's lack of spiritual growth or what people don't know. In other words, we always have new people. And I think I've preached something or I've taught something and I just expect, well, I taught that before. Everybody ought to know it. And I don't realize we've got new folks. They don't know the things. They haven't been trained. They haven't been taught. And, uh, man, you've got to teach over and over and over again. And I, don't, I, I enjoy teaching something the first time. And after that, I'm bored with it. It's like, wow. But, you know, with kids, it's like you've got to teach them everything that a person ought to know if you do a good job, don't you? Now, some people don't. Some parents don't raise their children. They don't train their children. But training's a lot of work. And so I just want to say from the perspective of Eli uh, that the response that he had to Hannah, I could see him, if it were me in Eli's position, the way I would think about it would be, thank you very much for dedicating your son to the Lord. Uh, go home and raise him. And uh, when he's grown, we'll see what his temperament's like and if he has a desire to serve God and we'll see if we've got a place for him around here. Bring him back in about, oh, I don't know, 15 years or so. <laughs> or at least when he's a teenager. And again, teenagers are useful. They're gullible and they're useful all the same. You know, they're just perfect. And so, <laughs> some of y'all don't like teenagers. I do. I think they're awesome. So, anyway, uh, the, the fact of the matter is, is that Eli responded really well. He was really, really thrilled, wasn't he? It seemed like. Do you remember when... God called Samuel in the middle of the night. That's in this story here. That's in this is in this account. And Eli, uh, Eli knew that God had talked to Samuel. And Samuel didn't want to tell Eli what God had said to him about his sons. And uh, Eli said, "Go ahead, tell me everything. Don't keep anything back from me." And then after he heard what God had said, he just received it. I like Eli. You know, you say you may say, "Well, he, he let his children do." Uh, terrible things. He raised them wrong. No, we know we know Eli was flawed. But I'm saying as a person, I like the guy. I, that's my impression. And there are people I don't like in the Bible. I read about them and I'm like, you know, I don't like you. But Eli's not one of them. I think he's likable. Uh, Samuel turned out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Didn't he? A lot of the same circumstances that Eli was trained in. Of course, there's a lot of teaching there about, uh, about uh, the will of a child. I want to give Hannah a lot of credit for how Samuel turned out. Uh, I want to say that Hannah knew the Lord, loved the Lord, and that probably by the time she turned him over to Samuel, his character was formed in a lot of ways. He certainly was, had character that Hophni and Phinehas didn't have Eli's children. I want to just look this evening, I want to look at a couple of verses in particular, and all I want to observe is the differences in responding to the Lord. In other words, from different people's perspectives. The perspectives we have here tonight are Eli's perspective, Samuel's perspective, and also Hophni and Phinehas' perspectives. Does that make sense? In other words, the people that we're going to look at this evening. I just, uh, you, you ought to read... You ought to read all the way through yourself. We would have to read several chapters this evening to get the whole account. Uh, but go down to verse 22 in, um, in uh, chapter 2. And we'll, we'll just look at Eli's perspective. The Bible says, Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Now there's a question that Eli asked his sons, and this is his perspective. His perspective was, Sons, why are you doing this? I've heard about what you're doing. You have a bad reputation. That's his perspective. Now, Eli is not condoning here, is he? He's not saying, guys, you know, you're turned out just the way I wanted you to. You followed my example to a T. I don't think this is the example that Eli set. I don't think he said, you know, I don't think his son said, well, the reason we're doing it is because we learned from our daddy. That's not what he's saying. That's not what they're saying. But he asked him a question, and he's saying, you know, what you've done is you've made the Lord's people to transgress. In other words, you've done evil and you've caused 
evil to be done. And then uh, I want to look, if you would, with me down to verse 13 of chapter 3. This is God speaking to Samuel about Eli. And this is God's perspective about Eli. So Eli's perspective, we could say, would be that he did not agree with what his children did. Everybody understand that? Of course, he's challenging them, and he's telling them they're wrong, and telling them why they're wrong. But I want to look at God's perspective, because this gives us a great deal of insight. In verse 13 of chapter 3, Samuel is told by God, For I have told him, he's talking about Eli, for I have told him, him being Eli, that I will judge his house forever because the iniquity which he knoweth. Because his sons made themselves vile. And he restrained them not. And God's perspective is, Eli, you know what your sons have done. Eli's question was, why are you doing this? You're, you're making God's people to sin. God's perspective was, Eli, why don't you stop him? You know, a lot of times we play the game sometimes of being right about something enough to satisfy our conscience. And I believe from what the Scripture says that God is holding Eli accountable not for satisfying his conscience, but he's holding him accountable for not doing right. Mm -hmm. and a lot of times we as believers are satisfied to say something. You know, uh, that's, the, that's the statement right now, isn't it? That's the buzzword for preventing bad things. If you see something, say something. Let me take it a step further. If you see something, do something. If you see something, do something. Can I pick on you, Anthony? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to pick on Anthony just a little bit. I scared him pretty good again. How often do I scare you, Anthony? On What do you think on average? A lot. A lot? Okay. <laughs> I scare Anthony a lot. Yeah. So, pretty much, he locked me out. He locked me out. What night was that? You locked me outside. What was it? Uh, today? You, you locked me in today. You locked other people out. When you, you know when you locked, we went out and took the trash. Oh, we went Thursday night. Oh, yeah. Just took the trash out. Anthony's job in our house, he takes the trash out on, uh, on Monday nights and Thursday nights. And he was doing his job. I was outside. And I saw him come out, you know, to make sure that he made sure the trash was already out. He made sure it was out. And then he went inside and like a good person does, he locked the door except I was outside. So I'm like, man, I, I headed for the door when I saw him going for it. I was like, I got to get there before he locks it. And I got there right after he went in. I was following him. I was going to kind of scare him that way. But I didn't make it in time. He closed the door and locked it. <laughs> so I knocked on the door. Did I knock on her or ring the doorbell? I knocked on her, right? Just kind of tapped it. And then I hid beneath the glass where he couldn't look out and see me. So he comes and you can, you can hear him kind of like looking out, trying to see who's out there. Couldn't see anybody. So then you hear the door unlock. He opens it slowly. And I'm behind the door going like this. And then I reached around and grabbed his hand. And he screamed like a girl. <laughs> well, like a growly girl. <laughs> That's his scream, you know. And he, he screamed like a girl. And uh, I laughed and said, I got you. Ha -ha. Then I came back and I said, you know what? A guy like you shouldn't be scared of somebody grabbing their hand. I have a little bit of courage. He's, he's working on it. He's growing some courage. But the reality is, is that most people see something and say something or see something and scream about it, but not many people see something and do something. And I promise you, if you reached around the corner and grabbed my hand, <clears throat> you might be a giant, but I'm going to hurt you. If you grab my hand. Or you're going to hurt me, but I'm not going to scream. And you know, there's just a difference in mentality. So it's not wrong if Anthony to be unless you do it again. If I ever scare you again, you're in a lot of trouble, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it's it, that's just an illustration of something. But you know, our response usually is, "Oh, that's bad." Well, somebody somebody should do something. And that was Eli when he raised his kids. <clears throat> you guys, that's gonna that's what you're doing is really bad. 
You're making people to sin. I mean, he could explain the whole reason why it's not good. Who is responsible for what happened in the temple? Who was in charge of the place? Eli, Eli. Eli was. He was the judge, too. He was the judge of the nation. And he didn't judge his own sons. God said, Eli, this judgment's going to come upon you because you didn't restrain your children. You didn't stop it. Eli's perspective, this is bad and I don't approve. And I have to say, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, I agree with you, Eli. God's perspective, Eli, you should have done something. You should have done something about it. You know, we have churches full of people that pat Christians on the head and tell them they're so sorry that they've done everything perfectly and for some reason Proverbs 22.6 didn't work. You know what Proverbs 22.6 says? Train up a child in the way he should go and he's old and not depart from it. And we have all kinds of ways of taking the Word of God and making it not mean what it says. Well, it's just a proverb. Well, my friend, how come the Scripture quotes Proverbs if it's not Scripture? If it's not a promise? It's more than just a wise saying. Listen, I'm not beating anybody up here tonight. I wouldn't beat Eli, Eli up here tonight. I'll be honest with you. I wouldn't beat him up at all, but I would have to tell him the truth, just like God did. You know, I don't know how many times I've sat in seminars and conferences and churches where Christians are told, you know, you, know, you did everything right raising your child, and it just, he just went bad. I don't know why, he just went bad. Just He just turned against the Lord and... You know, we just don't understand it. I'm not a Calvinist, are you? I don't believe that God picks people to be saved and lost. I, I, I just, I'll just be honest with you. I think that anyone who believes that God predetermines whether a child will be saved or lost shouldn't have kids. How would you like to be a parent of a child that goes to hell? Listen to me now. I'm not, I'm not being silly and I'm not being mean. I'm being serious. How would you like to be a parent of a child that goes to hell? That'd be terrible, wouldn't it? Is that the kind of God that says train up a child the way he should go? No. What God plainly says about it, I, I don't know how many times I've heard Eli preached. Eli was a priest in the temple. He was a good man. He rebuked his sons. And they still went bad. God said He didn't restrain them. That's what God said. Now let me ask you a question. Let's judge between the two. Let's put ourselves in that seat. Do you dare? I don't. God's right, isn't He? God's right, isn't He? A Christian, it's kind of hard sometimes what you have to say and what you have to preach, but it also kind of helps. Because when a person believes that the buck stops here, he behaves differently. See, Eli, I believe, honestly thought or at least he was willing to just rest on the reality, for his reality, that saying something was doing something. But saying something was doing nothing. We've got the fabric of our society in a very, very dangerous place today because we have a nation full of cowards. People that say something even, but oftentimes won't even say anything. And we think it's so courageous to say something. I mean, when somebody comes out about anything, we just laud them for their courage. My friend, saying something isn't anything at all. I'll be quite frank with you, what you do does say more than what you say. And I can imagine Eli standing up in the judgment seat and saying to the people in Israel, I talked to them, I told them that's bad. And then people were walking away and saying, well, you know, at least we got a good priest. At least we got a good judge. I don't think so. You know what the result? You know what the result of what Eli did ultimately ended up being? We're going to see as we study through Samuel further. We're going to actually see the result is that the children of Israel decide they don't want a priest for a judge. They want a king because of what they learned from Hophni and Phinehas. I don't think they learned it from Samuel. That's the result of it. And if I could preach one thing into the hearts of people, 
with the help of God, it would be courage to do right. Courage to say, I won't stand for it, I won't condone it, I won't compromise for it. So many parents, so many Christians with brothers and sisters compromise God's truth because they don't really want to ostracize or they don't really want to... Uh, they're afraid that they just can't have good results. Well, if I deal with that, they'll never speak to me again. Well, you might be surprised. Uh, we don't have time this evening. But let me summarize for sake of time. If you'll read 2 Corinthians or 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and you look at the man that had taken his father's wife, that Paul rebuked the church for being puffed up and not doing something about it. When they did something about it, you'll find in 2 Corinthians that man got right. What made the man get right? The church doing right. You know, parents, you don't stand a prayer of your children turning unless you do right by them. I won't be part of that. That's wicked. And I'm going to stop you from that. Because it's godless. Christians, your brothers and sisters, well, you know, I mentioned to them that they ought to pray about that. How many times we tell somebody to pray about something that we know they shouldn't pray about? We know it's wrong. Maybe you should pray about that before you... What kind of a... I almost said stupid. My wife's here. I got busted. But what kind of a thing would that be? To tell somebody something that you know the Bible, the Bible condemns that they ought to pray about. You don't have to pray about something that's wrong. You don't have to pray about it to you. Let's look at two other people. Two other people groups. And uh, I would like to look at Samuel... Uh, in verse 19. Samuel grew and the Lord... This is chapter 3, by the way. I didn't mean to confuse you. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Samuel grew and the Lord was with him and did let none of his words fall to the ground. Samuel's the kind of young man that anything God said, it went in. And it didn't get lost. Truth wasn't lost on him. I've had the privilege in my ministry of getting to pastor people that are Samuels. Getting to pastor people that are Samuels. I'll tell you some names. Alex Lopez. Alex Lopez got saved when he was 24 years old. We're the same age. He's a couple months older than me. So when I was 24, I was assistant pastor in Delray Beach, and Alex got saved as assistant when when he when we lived in Delray Beach. He met our pastor in the Bahamas and then came to our church. I said to Alex right after he got saved, I said, "You know, being 24 years old and a new Christian, you're going to need to grow pretty fast. So maybe you ought to think about going to Christian college. That way, you sit in chapel, you take Bible classes, and you know you get about." Uh, ten times more church than most people get in a normal setting. And uh, we were taking a college days trip. Alex is 24 years old. He's got a job. He's got a career. He's a firefighter. got a good job, a really good job in the, in the Bahamas, being flown to work during the week in the Bahamas and making really good money as a firefighter. And he quit his job and went to Christian college. <laughs> uh, years later... Uh, a couple of years later, he ended up being in our ministry here. And I realized after a while, you better be careful about giving Alex advice because he'll do whatever you advise him to do. I mean, if I just tell him, you know, this might be a good idea. He's already done it before. I mean, he, he went and bought something or he went and registered for something. or I mean, he's just doing it instantly. That's Samuel with the Lord. In other words, you they take counsel, they take wisdom and advice very, very seriously. And when Alex would come and ask me about something, I liked to give him counsel. I'd be careful as good counsel because he'd listen to me. But I like to give counsel to somebody that listens. Do you ever try to help somebody that, won't, that you can't tell them anything? They know everything about everything. Hey doc, what's up? What's it like when people come and tell you what's wrong? How often do people come and tell you what they need? Every patient does. How's it feel? Dr. Google. Dr. Google. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, why do you come? Do you ever say, have you ever said, why do you come to me? And you say, I'm glad you come because I get paid anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Hey, it, how many of you guys are professionals and you have people that aren't professionals? They come to you because they need your help, but they don't want to hear what you have to say. It's frustrating, isn't it? You know, God's got a lot of children that are that way. When He gives them truth and it's just plain, clear, evident. Well, God, you know that works for most people, but you know, you've got to understand my circumstances. I mean, people literally tell God things like that as though He doesn't understand their circumstances. Well, you know, it's really hard. You know, is it not really hard for anybody to do right? Doing right wouldn't be a decision if it were easy. You'd just do the easiest thing and it'd be right. Right? Doing right is usually a decision because it's difficult. But when you come to the place where you're like a Samuel and you say, I'm not going to let any of God's words fall to the ground. If God says it, that's, that's my position. And that's the end of it. Okay, let's look at Hophni and Phinehas in contrast then with Samuel. And that would be going back to chapter 2. And uh, I believe it is verse 25. The last phrase of verse 25. Eli's given him this stern warning. Look at this. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. You wish, right? Who's the judge? Eli. Eli is, yeah. Evidently not. But if a man... You see that, do you see after looking at God's take on it, you see the hypocrisy in what uh, Eli is saying here, or just the inconsistency of it at least? But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Who's going to entreat for a person that sins against God? A judge can judge between people, but who's going to judge between a man and God? If anyone should have known that, if anyone should have applied that, Eli should have said, what did I just say? The Bible says, notwithstanding, speaking of Hophni and Phinehas, they hearkened not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. They didn't listen to their father even if God was going to slay them. Samuel did let none of his words fall to the ground. God spoke to Samuel. God was with Samuel. And Samuel didn't let anything fall to the ground. The, the, the saying is literally, don't let anything slip by me. But Hophni and Phinehas listen and they're like, because God's going to judge me? They didn't care. And of course, just like God told Samuel, they both died on the same day. And then the result was that Eli tragically died. Is anybody happy reading that story? No. Is that a happy and It's just a sad story, isn't it? There's a lot of sad stories. And what I want to conclude with this evening is this. One, while you're living, it's never too late. While you're living, it's never too late. Even after God had told Samuel about Eli, Eli already knew. God had already told him. But even after God had told Samuel about Eli, Eli still said, well, you know, it is what it is. It's going to be what it's going to be. He still didn't do anything. Man, I'm telling you, a, a, a man like Samuel, I would say at that time ought to go and say, you and you, come here now. You're done. I mean, you're really done. And do something about it. Eli said, well, it's done. Can't do anything about it. And that will predicate the results that you get, that kind of an attitude. Friend, while you're breathing, you're not done. Do you hear me? While you're alive, you're not done. I don't care where your where your brothers and sisters are at, or where your father and mother are, or where your children are, whatever the case is, where you have the duty to do more than say something, but to do everything that can be done. You're not done. You're not finished. And God can do miracles. Do you hear me? God can do miracles. We as believers need to be careful that we are not satisfied to say something. What we need to be satisfied is only if we do everything that can be done. And there is a difference, isn't there? Mm -hmm. There's a difference. 
We need to be Samuels ourselves. You know, Samuel could have had probably the same lame excuse as Hophni and Phinehas. Well, you know, that's how Eli let us grow up. But he did. I believe his character was instilled by his mother. But he also turned out differently in the same household. What's the reason for it? Well, they didn't let anything that God said fall to the ground. Whereas Hophni and Phinehas said, well, you know, if God, I mean, because God's going to judge us. That's it. That's the, that's the reason why we need... <laughs> They didn't care about what God said. You better take it seriously when God speaks to you. When He privileges you by conviction. How oft do we say, God, convict me of my sin. Show me when I'm wrong. And God, I invite you to examine me. And I invite you to show me if there's a wicked way in me. God will do it if you ask Him to. And that's a Samuel attitude. I want to have that. I want to, I want to trend that direction, not the Hophni Phinehas direction. You know what I mean? I hope that's a help to you this evening. Father, Lord, some of the things that we hear from Your Word are hard words. And yet, God, when we come to the place where we agree with You, we can actually see where it's not so much hard as it is right. Help us to do right, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for your attention tonight. You're dismissed.